Let me introduce you to Gillian Mears, far and away one of our best Australian novelists. Uh, I've known her work for, for a while, but only met her last year at a forum on euthanasia. And we got chatting about death, as you do, or as we certainly, as we <laughs> certainly do. She's got a particularly interesting take on the topic, which we'll come to later. And it's wonderful to have you sitting in a studio with me. I can hardly believe I'm here, Philip. I feel as if I've been in a Rip Van Winkle fairy tale and that life has just gone by in a flash because a moment ago I was a 14-year-old schoolgirl being wooed at Grafton High School by your essays, your essays. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. <laughs> you mean you were force-fed on them, you poor little bugger? <laughs> well, well... I've it's... often got to apologise to kids who were forced to read them. No, no, they were all part of the seduction. A new teacher had arrived from uh, Western New South Wales and he was... He would just uh, revolve a lesson around one of your pieces and truly, like... The whole class would be incredibly moved, particularly, and I reread this last night, Philip Adams and his faithful friend. Do you remember that essay? I do. It's yes. one of the first I ever wrote, actually. Right. Well, it moved me incredibly last night as I reread it all these years later. Um, but you know about animals, don't you? Yes. I do. Lassie, the, the impact of that dog and, and your description of it. Um, I was a very lonely little boy and Lassie was my only friend. <laughs> a real bitter of a dog. Gosh, I miss her. What's well, almost 70 years later. But let's start off in Grafton, which you've just mentioned. All I know about Grafton is it has the, the most wonderful display of jacaranda trees. Yes. I understand you have mixed feelings about Jacker, not about Jacarandas, but about Grafton. Well, Grafton now, because I haven't lived there for quite a while, it sort of floats in me like this impossible to reach island. And I'm full of longing for the town of Grafton now that I cannot live there. And I can't live there because multiple sclerosis the disease I've unfortunately been landed with, it cannot tolerate humidity. And so, so what's good for jacaranda trees is, is bad for Gillian. <laughs> this is you. Um, but in a sense, it's an extraordinary town. I, I think it's a town that um, inspires people to be creative because of its very oddness. It's... Uh, I mean, it's in from the coast a little bit, and so it's got all the strangeness of the deep American South. In my childhood, just strange things happened there, even though And yet you describe it as stifling quite often. Ah, but my perspective has changed. Um, Like, I really now can see its elegance and its beauty... Like, it's got classical Edwardian buildings and the most magnificent shade trees. Like, it's streets, it's best streets that haven't been ruined by the local council. They're just um, majestic with such old trees, like the roots of them push up the tar and... and Make it hard for wheelchairs. <laughs> True. I've, I've yet to be, be back to my old hometown in a wheelchair. But it's a fragrant town, yet within that there is a dark side and that has been, that has been what has fuelled my pen, in a sense. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining the town of Grafton very well. Everything you do, you explain well, Julian. Don't worry about that. I, I hadn't realised that, that your folks 
were not of not Australian, that they were Rhodesian. Well, my father was South African from English stock, but he moved to Rhodesia to be a soil conservation officer. And my mother, she was a London girl who was travelling around the world, but her first stop was Rhodesia and and then she met Dad and they fell in love and <laughs> that was the end of her travels. You've said in the past that you didn't feel, as a consequence of this, fully Australian. No, and you see, this is where riding horses as a child, it, it gave me an inroad into meeting real Australians, as in fourth generation dairy farmers. And I can say without a doubt that if I could have ridden my horse up to your back fence in Eltham and met your grandpa and uncle, I would have been as happy as the breeze because I loved talking to real Australians and learning that language. Um, and, and a vernacular which has vanished now. Yes. Which is so sad. Grandpa I'm, and Uncle, who were twins and yes, farmers, yeah. had spoken a way that I can, I can evoke if I really try. Yeah. But it passed away, I think, in about the 50s when television arrived. Well, there are still pockets that retain that beautiful, like it's a poetry, it's its Absolutely. own wild poetry. Mm. And how I wrote Falls Bread, in a sense, was I would just ring up my, my old contacts from that dairy farming world and... Uh, We're on television too, so I'm uh, holding up the book oh, to the camera. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and it would be like a consolation from the day just to hear those rhythms just telling me the story of the day. Well, this is where you like Barbara Baton because she tried to, a phonetic way yeah. of describing Australian bush language and you come close to that in, 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 in Foles Bread. Yeah, well, look, in a sense it's a hymn to Herbert Tout, West Warhope, living there on the Hastings River at the junction of the Forbes River and Hastings. It's his voice that told the story of Falls Bread in that I just tapped into the way he tells stories and it became my voice, even though it's obviously not my voice. I've got my mother's voice as I speak. But, um, look, he could be telling the most heartbroken tale and yet you would still find yourself dissolving into laughter. And um, I'm sure if I could have listened to your grandpa and gone along to the nights with the piano, I just would have been in my element. It was like, um, it's like falling back into a dance partner's arms and they've just got the perfect ability to hold you in the rhythm. Can I ask you a very personal question? Yes. Okay. The Mears girls, four of you, you're the third. You were once described in a feature article as, well, you plural, as a precocious free-thinking pack that scandalised and titillated the community. True or false? Mm, not how I would have described us. Uh, we were definitely a pack because of that difference, not being Australian. And we did because our horses would invariably get out of the rope fence our father had built against the floods. Our horses would upset people pockmarking their perfect lawns because we lived in the old ferryman's house and either side of us would stretch kind of the um, rich people's lawns and it seemed I spent half my childhood with a sack of soil on my back going and filling in the pockmarks. But... 
Hi. Okay, I want to get on to you as being a source of scandal. The um, the English and history teacher you mentioned earlier who um, bullied you into reading some of my stuff, you, uh, you eloped to Sydney with him <laughs> once you'd finished school. Well, that was just furthering your education. Well, again, you see those journalism articles are not entirely accurate. But definitely I had a, a love affair with my English history teacher that I don't regret. All that I regret is that I subsequently married him. Ah, uh, bad career move. It was, it was really not what I wanted to do. And then subsequently that marriage came to an end in a way that I'm not particularly proud of. But you're, you've had so many fascinating relationships. You've cast a wide net when it's come to partners. Well, I, I would think I've been very moderate <laughs> compared to many women my age. <laughs> yeah. But you haven't been afraid of taking emotional risks, have you? All I've wanted is not to enter the kingdom of lamb chopped them. That's how I kind <laughs> of, like, once the lovely romance is over with the man or the woman and then you descend into this domesticity where you're hissing and spitting at each other. Nothing wrong with lamb chops uh, with a bit of mint sauce and some mashed potato. I agree. (laughs) But you don't want that to be the diet forever and ever and ever. Yes. It's a a big fear. Uh, We might come back to that later. I hadn't realised that we have something else in common and that's a passion for archaeology because that's what you went off to Sydney Uni to study. Yes, and look, as a small girl, my bookshelves were just full of, you know, histories of ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient Rome. I mean, ancient history was what I just adored and I believed fully. Like, I went as a nine-year-old to the Parthenon and I, I had a sling at the time and I was just filling, filling up my sling with pot sherds, which, you know, they had... Oh, fantastic. Like, yeah. they had, you know, actual drawings of warriors. I mean, they were real. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, I know, of course, I wouldn't be allowed to go to the Parthenon today and steal such items. But. It's funny that the first thing you were actually given was identical to the first thing I actually bought, which was a tiny Horus. Yeah, right. Look, I cherished that Horus for uh, my lifetime and I feel feel it was stolen by an embittered lover, if you must know the truth. I mean, it vanished from my life. Do you want to name the lover and we'll sort of send out a a hit squad to sort of get it back? No, No, but Grafton High School had a mummy's head in the library, which was subsequently given to the Nicholson Museum. Yeah. So archaeology... Why did, why did you give up on archaeology? Oh, uh, it was because I just needed a break from study, basically. Like, I went straight from high school to Sydney Uni and I knew that I needed to just escape from study for a while. And I don't want to sort of be overly pretentious, but you could argue that you've taken an archaeological approach to your writing. You know, you collect bits and pieces and you examine them and try to make sense of them. I feel this is true, Philip. Like, um, you mentioned Helen Garner. I first won a short story prize with a story called Relics of the Past and It's exactly about that, that I'm just sifting through, sifting through my very short life and reassembling it as best I may and... Are you a journal keeper or just a memory hoarder? I used to keep journals very lovingly. It's one of the sadnesses of MS that there just isn't time for those beloved activities anymore. I could virtually weep that, um, like, 
just your daily activities take such a long time now within this new framework of a wheelchair. How do you write? Do you dictate as I did for half a century or do you...? You did that, did I dict- you? I hardly wrote a word for 40 years. Is that right? Well, no, no. You should try it. It's terrific. Yes. Well, I may be forced into that. But, no, I definitely had a love affair with um, pens and paper and... You funny old fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you tap away at a little computer now? I do, but, yeah. um, like... My first books were written on an old Olivetti that... Something else we had in common. <laughs> yeah, that belonged to that that English teacher. But it, it was fantastic. Like, I... Beautifully designed typewriters. That was when Italian design was cutting edge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for a long time I, I tried to be in the tradition of Gerald Monane and keep a hold of my old typewriters, but it it was becoming ridiculous, like lumbering them around when you could no longer find anyone who could repair the E key that was no longer working. Yeah. Yeah. You could write... Who was it that wrote an entire novel without the letter E? That the French fellow, the entire novel without the letter E. It might have been forced on him by a malfunctioning Olivetti. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is Gillian Mears and we're having a lovely chat on Late Night Live about about her life and times. It's hard to see with your sort of uh, somewhat precocious behaviour as a youngster that you were timid. You, and yet you say that you, just, you talk about a shy, introverted girl. Well, look, I was shy, Philip. There's no doubt about it. Like, I unfortunately used to blush and I unfortunately was moved into this ferryman's house that had the two most popular boys either side of me. And um, so we were, we were new to the town of Grafton and they had found out that if they pumped up their arms to resemble an erection, I would blush. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would too. <laughs> and they had just found out Are you I blushed. blushing now? I, no. I'm not. <laughs> It'll be picked up by the cameras. <laughs> you can blush on radio, but not on, not on video. Yeah. Um, and that's where horses again came to save me because if I was kind of riding my horse and we had a spectacular horse who used to rear up on, uh, at command, like I just felt invincible and it would overcome all of that. Incredible. So shyness. the fact that you can't ride now must be one of the greatest losses. It is. And just like I so miss just the rituals, the like just the care, caring for your horse. and The time it takes to put a saddle on, for example, yes. wiping them down afterwards. Yes. The I, smell of a horse. I know. Look, just, just stroking my horse's neck and... And just the jingle of a bit, I, it, it's a colossal grief. And um, look, I'm going back to Grafton next month and I'm determined that I will at least go and smell a horse again. Yeah. When you wrote The Mint Lawn, and given that this is being simulcast, uh, we're filming it for the RN website and you'll find it on YouTube, uh, so I'll hold up. The Mint Lawn, da dum da dum. Uh, this novel, in fact, dealt to some extent with your um, aforementioned and former music teacher. Now, as is often the case when you fictionalise, lightly fictionalise your life, you piss people off, don't you? Uh, I did with that book because, look, I wrote it as this young, angry woman. I mean, I was angry. I was kind of angry at how I had left my marriage but I was angry with the man himself and it just all poured out without any expectation that the manuscript was going to win a prize. I mean, I was headed for that Africa. That was bad luck, wasn't it, when the manuscript won that bloody Vogel, you know. Look, I, I, again, I wrote that book very swiftly, probably in three or four months, 
And its title came, nobody would know this, but its title came from, like, I pick pieces of paper up off pavements, Philip. Do you do that? No, no, I don't. I no. must admit, should I? I, I feel it's <laughs> always worth worth it. You what know? sort of pieces of paper uh, do you pick well, up, Well, you Julie? never know what you're going to find. Oh, and, right. Um, like they can be secrets and wonders. I've nicked a few little things that were tucked in the in the wailing wall. You're not meant to do that. You just have a read, put them back. But they're they're rather narrow in the <laughs> range of interests. So, have you discovered anything wonderful on the footpath? Well, I've found the, the title. The gutter press. <laughs> I found the title of the mint lawn. Is that right? Yes. Um, the title. Yeah. Yeah. The Mint Lawn, I stole it from whoever had written it because it just it fitted in with how I wanted to write about Grafton and my mother and just attempting to be other in a country town. Who else, who else do you think you've hurt with your honesty, the essential, the honesty that's mandatory for a decent writer? I know that um, my only living aunt will no longer speak with me because of that risk that possibly anything she anything she that she says may land up in a short story, um, and that is how I, I see myself as a little bird. Truly, that. I'm constantly just gathering with my writing beak. A little, a little bird. I think not. Bruce, Bruce Pascoe, your friend, once said this about you. She looks straight through whatever she sees. Frank Hardy would have killed to have her facility with language. I fear for anyone she meets. <laughs> she knows you instantly. And what is worse, she tells other people. People like her are to be revered and feared. They come amongst us like tuning forks and make awful sense of our confusion. It's a, for a piece of stinging criticism, it's a glowing tribute, isn't it, really? <laughs> it is. I can hardly believe he's describing me. <laughs> Doesn't seem to fit? Well, I, I love to hear that. Um, but Bruce Pascoe has been my most ardent uh, admirer since, you know, since I was not even 20 years old. He published my first short story. Did he now? Yes. If you're listening, Bruce, good on you. <laughs> the Loss of Mothers, a thread uh, through your book. Uh, throughout my books? Um, well, I guess so. Uh, the Grass Sister certainly was looking at the recent death of my own mother. I mean... A lot of the, f it's a fiction, but a lot of it sprang up from my own recent grief. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking of other... Well, Noah, Noah's mother in Foles Bread dies well, after giving birth to, to her. Yeah, and no Noe herself, I mean, she's the main death of the book. In the book. Have you always had the same preoccupation or fascination with death as I've had, or has it been intensified by orders of magnitude because of MS? No, I feel I always have. I, I can recall as a child, um, like we were studying Measure for Measure, and Isabella, she's, she's facing her brother's death unless she sleeps with this man, and um, she's just crying out, oh, to die and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot. And I remember that just sent reverberations of terror into me, so much so that I, um, I phoned up my mother. I woke up in the middle of the night and I phoned her up, uh, she was elsewhere because I was just um, alarmed. The whole idea of dying, it was as if it had suddenly come upon me that this was I remember being hit by a single sentence in Seven Little Australians 
Yeah. When one of the characters who I m- most loved is lying dying. Judy. And her foot touched the water. And that yeah. was the sort of the metaphor for yeah. death. I'm, I suppose I was eight or something and, God, that haunted me. I mm. read and reread that those words trying to get my mind around them and, of course, it's pretty hard to do. Yeah, but... I would have shed many tears over seven little Australians as well. And then my poor mother, as she was dying, she was forced to hear Fast Falls, the Eventide. You know, Judy gets read yeah, that. Yeah. Somebody in my family decided to read my poor mother that as she she could no longer talk. And, um, yeah, death. Okay, yeah. let's talk about death. It's... Uh, now a very real part of your life. Well, as one of my most revered writing instructors says, to revere life is to revere movement, change in all its forms, lovely and frightening. And I sort of think, well, death is just a continuation of life and that... um, since that parliamentary forum, um, I mean, there's been an acceleration in me since speaking to Dr. Rodney Syme that um, that discussion with him has emphasised to me that I do actually have control over my own death. I should tell the listener and the, the looker that this was at a, a euthanasia conference which was held at uh, New South Wales Parliament, not in Parliament but in one of the anti-rooms and uh, we were there in support of a private members bill which was being shoved into Parliament to try mm-hmm. and get a, a more rational attitude to uh, to voluntary euthanasia and it was a it was a pretty good conference, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. <gasps> but you've been thinking about these things very, very deeply for quite a long time. Yeah, well, just um, the deprivations and the sufferings of MS. I mean, I'm sure there's many people with MS who would agree. Like you think of ending your own life frequently just to escape the horror of it. Okay, I've got to ask you about the horrors. Are we talking about intensity of pain, high levels of discomfort? What is it that Uh, makes life so intolerable? Yeah, I mean, there is always a degree of physical anguish, but it's also what is now no longer possible in my life, so, so that... So it's anger in a sense as well. Yeah, yeah, fury. I mean, it's lucky I haven't taken to smashing China as my mother used to do because people would be excavating more than willow pattern plates at, in my house. Um, you always find shards of willow pattern and at farms, don't you? Yeah, and and I think you found some when you went back. Yes, to my to your little, grand- the little grandparents' farm. Yes, I I love that detail. Yeah. <gasps> but you see now, having talked recently with Dr. Rodney, as I call him, I mean, we spoke quite frankly about barbiturates. Yeah. And um, he has given me um, a medication. So I feel this enormous relief. It's this it's this um, unfolding of comfort. So you've got a feeling of power and control on your Yes. Mind. Doesn't mean you'll exercise it. Exactly. But you can it's like, you know, in hospital when they sort of connect you to the morphine drip and you can control the dose by pressing the little button. All the evidence is that people use less morphine when they've got control. Yes. I mean, Dr Kenneth Hillman spoke a lot about morphine in surprising terms at that forum 
Um, well, one of the things which surprised us all is he said you cannot, in fact, kill yourself with an overdose of morphine, as I recall. That's it. He emphasised it again and again and again because I think it's a common... Uh, it's a common error that people think, uh, yeah, up, up increase that morphine and you'll die, but all it causes is respiratory failure, which is not the most easy of deaths. Let's, let's talk about the onset of this uh, slow-motion death sentence. When you are in your 30s, your legs started to go. You must have flailed around trying to rationalise this. Well, look, looking at um, the recent footage of um, Chrissy Amphlett, the divine horse singer who died with MS only a f- few weeks ago, like at first everyone thinks you're drunk, which is kind of ironic because I had only recently given up my heavy drinking, but then the onset of this condition meant that I was losing my balance but there was no immediate diagnosis. So Every, f- everyone at writers' festivals told me you were always pissed. <laughs> Made that up. <laughs> so up. you were misdiagnosed as being inebriate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and look, it was just the mystery. It was the mystery of suddenly. I mean, only horses really fully apprehended that something was badly wrong with me. What do you mean by that? Well, I I was losing my agility and my balance and... um, They'd sense that the girl on on their back was out of control. Yes, um, sadly so. Mm. And uh, it just got worse from there on in. I mean, I was only 30 years old. <gasps> yeah. How long did it take until you had a diagnosis? It was another seven years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And when when you got the diagnosis, did you feel better or worse? I felt practically euphoric. Is that right? Yeah, because finally I could just put that instant label on my... Um, and it was only, see, that was only after having open heart surgery that I just met a neurologist who was determined to diagnose what was wrong with my walking. So I'd always put my hands together to him. Holding up the book, Falls Bread, where's the camera? There it is. Uh, this was a very, very difficult book to write physically, wasn't it, for you? Mm, yes, yes. Because by the time I really sat down to write it, which was in 2009, the sharp deterioration in my walking had begun. And you are in a wheelchair. Yeah, that that led me into a wheelchair. And also then the subsequent proofreading and editing of it. By then I was in a hospital bed and doing it on my side. So... Yeah, it really was by then a work. In any sense, do you think that, just as I've always argued, that an awareness of mortality is a great aphrodisiac for living, is there any sense in which having MS made you a better writer? Look, I often often ask myself, what, what would I have written had this condition not overtaken my life? Um, who knows? But I can think that I've definitely written about losing the ability to move in very poetic ways, like in my book of short stories, A Map of the Gardens. I think some of those stories, their their wonder came from this horror of... Yes, suddenly not being able to walk. Um, Yeah, so it's a bit of a paradox. Almost every worthwhile thing is a paradox. (laughs) What do you think death will be like? I mean, you know my views that that's it, but that's not your view, is it? Look, 
I think you and all the other many atheists I know are going to get the most marvellous surprise. I do. I mean, um, you might think... We don't get another go. It's Pascal's wager. We lose. <laughs> We're cast into outer darkness and God says, told you so. Look, no, I truly believe you're in for a surprise because I think that when we die, we will be greeted by great love. I mean, you can call that God or you can call that Lassie. She'll only have a stump of her tail because she'll have wagged it off. She'll be so happy to see you again. I mean, it is sentimental, I know, but it's what I believe that all my beloveds, including many, many, many beloved silver wisdom cats, or whatever your feeling of love is, I just feel it will be all enveloping and I feel this because I did virtually die. I I virtually died of endocarditis in 2002 and I virtually died. It was virtual death on the heart and lung machine. I died and appeared as an owl in one of my sister's kitchens. But I was called back. I mean, I know people think... It's airy-fairy, new-age nonsense. But if you've experienced it, it becomes very real. Like I've just been talking to one of the world's great authorities on resuscitation. He's a, a young American doctor who's uh, who points out that you can now, with, with a bit of luck, resuscitate someone who's been dead, really dead, mm. for hours, for hours. And uh, he argues that it is a universal response to people that come from people that come back that they have a very nice time. Yeah. So you're getting a tiny bit of scientific support. I find this rather concerning. And I point out that the, the, pe the few people I know who carked it, my beloved colleague Robin Williams and the dreaded Kerry Packer, had no happy experiences. But. Uh, you know, I hope for your sake it's right, and as you suggest, I'll be furious if you are. <laughs> what am I going to say? I Have you been wrong for 70 years? <laughs> yeah, look... And you won't know if you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I mean, of course, who is to know? But we will all know. <laughs> we will. But it uh, means you're not afraid. No. Does it mean that? Yes, it means I'm not afraid. No. Not at and all? I would have been afraid prior to this um, talk with Dr Syme um, because I think if you die an incredibly physically awful death, perhaps, yeah, that horror is with you. There was another experience, wasn't there, involving electrocution? What was that? Well, that was on the way to the Leonard Cohen concert I, in 2009. Um, well, look, I had been in such a death-desiring mode and death-desiring mood. I've often thought of life as this kind of board game. And I was saying, look, please let me land on death. No, let me land on the black square and and you land on the black square and you pick up the card and it says, congratulations, you are dead and no more turns. And so I was in that mode and I was on my way to the Leonard Cohen concert in my converted ambulance and I was just carelessly unplugging an electrical power cord with wet hands, and this has never happened to me before, but there was an almighty kind of an electrical shock, so severe that my whole wrist and hand turned black and it hit my heart and <laughs> I didn't die, but I looked down and, and there was a black square in the middle of my shirt, my favourite orange shirt, and it had 
it was as if God was saying, careful what you think, Gillian. Careful, do you really want to land on this black square right now? You use an analogy that you've been like a bird hovering over this or that philosophy, Buddhist retreats, not believing there's an end. And uh, But have you ever... Oh, let me ask you this. Were you raised in a religious uh, context by uh, the Rhodesian father and English mother? No, no, like not really. I mean, it was there as a background. My mother was a angry Catholic who'd abandoned the church and my father had gone through Anglican private schools in South Africa, but he doesn't basically believe in anything. I mean, he goes to church, but he's like you. He believes there'll be the deep abyss when he dies. <laughs> but that said... But that's not such a bad thing to believe, <laughs> Gillian. No, but that said... I mean, I'd prefer that to being reunited with most of my relatives, to be honest. <laughs> Anki and Grandpa. No, <laughs> oh, no, that, that, no, that'd be fine. You want to meet. That'd be fine. But he had this um, longing always to buy a white weatherboard Northern Rivers church... And it's a, it's a curious longing, but I think that was really his longing, like his daughter's, to be a true Australian, that that would kind of have made him an Australian. Nothing like a white weatherboard church to do that, is there? It was transferred to us because my younger sister and I, we wanted to buy a white weatherboard church and turn it into a library and put it on his block. Yeah. But, but it didn't. Really, I was never confirmed. I've never taken a wafer or had a sip of communion wine, and I'm kind of proud of that because I don't, um, I don't understand. I don't understand religion. Okay, you understand Leonard Cohen. You mentioned you were going to the concert when uh, this misadventure occurred. And I still think it's that electrocution has given you a sort of an aura. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's being picked up by the cameras. Tell me about you and Leonard Cohen. There's a particular song of his, isn't there, that means a lot to you? Yes, I've, I've put it in my will to be played at my wake. Um, look, I was close enough at that concert to virtually taste his sweat. And it was, it was like... Uh, it was like like the love. It was an open-air concert under the glossy stars and it's a wonder that we weren't all levitating there and then. Like he was like a prophet um, to an audience of young people and old people. And I know you may be not a Leonard man yourself. I've, look, I've only recently discovered him, would right. you believe? There's, I've been playing some of his music recently and it's, not, you, it's not too bad, Are is you it? listening to old ideas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, to me, like, that's the mystery I believe in, like the wind in the trees is talking in tongues. Like, it's inexplicable. But... He would say, I'm sure, that he believes in something other than the deeper. We will, we will play some Leonard Cohen at the end of our chat, which is rapidly approaching. Did you ever talk to him? No. To Cohen? You tasted I, his sweat, but you didn't have a conversation. I would, no. I, I would like to before he goes. But, I, but he's I like you in that sense, that he, that he feels so... <laughs> that he, he has loved very deeply and been unhappy in love. And, you know, he's, he celebrates pretty much the same things as you do. Well, if only I could reach those heights. Um, well, many people think that you do easily reach them, in, in, but particularly in false bread. I can't quite see where this, this gift of yours came from. Do you know? Do, 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 was it born in you? Was there a sort of a, a magic moment when a shaft of light from up above came down, like St Joan hearing her voices? I mean, you don't just write, you write. Uh, look, I think from that very early age, I 
what I fell in love with beyond anything else was language and dictionaries. And, I mean, that's what I have been cut off from. Like, I used to love my old paper book dictionaries, but they're heavy and I haven't quite made the leap into the digital world like a digital dictionary just does not give me what a paper dictionary used to give. It's got a great smell too, a yeah. paper dictionary. It's something else that people don't understand about books. Yeah. They smell good, yeah. like horses, yes. like puppies, yes. like loaves of bread. I love that. <laughs> yeah. That's You're precisely right. Yeah. And so without that kind of instant transmission, who knows what's going to be possible in the future. You talked about being angry. No, I said angry. You said fury. You don't seem to be furious now. You seem to be much more at peace. Mm. True? I think I've just got a social veneer that gets Uh. plastered on for radio interviews. (laughs) Um, No, I am still pretty angry. But, you see, I'm living in Sydney to be a miracle, Philip. I've come to Sydney to get out of this wheelchair. Um, It's taking a little longer than anticipated, but... um, Is it feasible? Yes. I'm, I'm working with the man who got me out of a wheelchair a decade ago, so... Uh, so we can, we don't have to attend the wake yet. Incidentally, where will this grand event with Leonard Cohen and others occur? Have you planned that? I mean, Gough Whitlam's planned his, and that's for um, Centennial Park because he's getting a large crowd. Well, mine is the Grafton Showground, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and the barn, which is this magnificent now old heritage. I mean, it's had a heritage order slapped on it. Because, um, you know, I, I revere showgrounds, as you would know from yeah. show rings, circles. Julian, we're going to let uh, Leonard Cohen take us out, only from the program, not from existence. Uh, but let me, let me sort of tell the listener and the looker that Julian Mears, author, most recently the prize-winning uh, novel Foles Bread, published by Alan and Unwin. What we're going to do is go out with the aforementioned Leonard Cohen, who's much more handsome now. He's an old, old bloke than he was when he was young. I know this because I've been looking at documentaries. And this is the song that if and when uh, Julian ever has a wake, you'll be hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Cohen and Closing Time. Yeah, we're drinking and we're dancing and the band is really happening and the Johnny Walker wisdom running high. And my very sweet companion, she's the angel of compassion. She's rubbing half the world against her thigh. And every drinker, every dancer lifts a happy face to thank her. The fiddler fiddles something so sublime. RN.